Good afternoon, friends. Welcome once again to River of Life Assembly Discipleship Program. And uh, we're excited about the beautiful weather we've got. We're finally into summer. The first day of summer was yesterday, and we're into another beautiful day. Nice and warm out, and the grass is looking great, and everything's uh, flowering, and everyone's excited about the summer weather finally getting here. But I trust that uh, more than anything, the sunlight of God's love is shining in your life. And uh, he, you're allowing him to make himself real to you, to speak to your heart, to pour out his blessings on you, and to help you to walk with him as you look into his word. And today we're going to uh, look into the word of God once again. Last week we uh, started a, a study on heaven and we uh, looked at some of the uh, aspects of heaven, the logic of heaven, and we talked about the philosophy of heaven. We talked about the history of heaven, going back from the Old Testament and, and historical times from Egypt and all the different early civilizations right up into our present day, how that civilizations have come and gone that have a belief in the existence of an afterlife, a place where people will spend eternity. Then we talked about the nature of heaven and uh, some of the things that we read in the Word of God are symbolic. Some of them are allegories. Some of them are literal. And we looked at some of those things. We talked about uh, different uh, religious groups and how they perceive heaven and how they talk and, and think about it. And today, we're going to look at heaven once again, continue on with our study, and we're looking at the New Jerusalem. And then once we finish with the New Jerusalem, we're going to begin to talk about uh, the facts about heaven, like the blissful rest that the saints of God, the children of God are called to. Uh, a reward of reaping, and a realm of righteousness, a region of responsibility, reunion and recognition, and the reliability of our hope. And uh, we're going to take some time to look at those things. Uh, but before we do, we want to bow our heads in prayer and ask God to help us as we look into his word today. Father, we thank you today for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word that's forever settled in heaven. We thank you for the gift of salvation that you purchased through your blood on Calvary. What we could not do, you could. You who knew no sin became sin for us. You paid our debt and paid it in full. And we thank you for that, Lord. We worship and glorify you as King of kings and Lord of lords and the lover of our soul. And we ask you to help us today as we look into the word of God, that you would speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. We're going to turn in the book of Revelations this week. Revelations, the 21st chapter. And that we're going to read a rather lengthy passage of scripture. Uh, and it deals with the heavenly Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem is referred to and spoke of in detail from verse 1 of Revelations 21 right down to verse 5 of Revelation 22. And it gives us a, a fantastic description, and we're going to look at that today. Some of it is symbolic, and is, it is represented as a new heaven and a new earth. It's represented to, referred to as the holy city, and it's referred to as the new Jerusalem. And we want to look at the new Jerusalem today, and we're going to start in Revelation 21. I'm going to start reading verse 1 through 8. John said, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. 
And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the waters of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and adulterers and liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The first principle that is referred to in the book of Revelations in reference to the New Jerusalem is the principle of the inhabitants. Who is it that's going to be in heaven? Well, friend, I can answer that just point blank very quickly. The redeemed. They used to sing that song. It's taken from the Bible. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. The redeemed, they're going to enter into the new Jerusalem and that's where we're going to spend eternity with God. The Bible says, and John said, that he saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And he said, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be their God, and he shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Now listen to what he says. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the waters of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. The Bible says that we overcome by the word of the Lamb, by the blood of the Lamb, excuse me, and the word of our testimony. So those that overcame and inherited all things that were in the New Jerusalem, the ones that were going to have all tears wiped from their eyes, that were not going to see sorrow or death, pain or sickness, nothing like that, no more separation, all of those things were going to be those possessed by those of the redeemed, the blood-washed, the sanctified, the born-again child of God. That's who's going to be there. That's the first principle. The second principle is found in the in same chapter, verse 9 through 21. And it is symbolic of the structure, the grandeur, and the scope of that city. Listen to what it says. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven blast plagues, and talk with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife, which is the church. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. He saw a city coming down from heaven. He compared it to something that was so bright and it was so glorious that he says that and her light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Well, talk about a, a beautiful city coming down out of God. 
Let's look at the rest of it, what else he says. And had a wall, great and high, and had 12 gates, and at the gates were 12 angels, and names written therein, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And of the city lieth four square, so it's a cube. And he said, the walls of the city, excuse me, and he talked with me and had a golden reed to measure and the gates thereof and the wall and the city lieth four square and the length of it is as large as the breadth and he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, and 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundation of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third, Galcedoni, the fourth was an emerald, the fifth was sardonyx, the sixth was sardis, the seventh was chrysolite, the eighth was beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, Sraspurus, uh, the eleventh, the Bible says, jasonite, the twelfth, and amorous. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every single gate was of one pearl, and the streets of the city was pure gold, and it was transparent as glass. What a description. And you know, it uses phrases, and, and please do not think that I'm trying to take away from the literal aspects of heaven when I say this. But I, I believe that sometimes some of the things that we read here are symbolic. The reason I say symbolic is when John was carried off in the spirit and saw this revelation of Jesus Christ and all the things that he saw, and he penned the words, all he could do was try and express through the education, the mental ability that he had, the things that he saw. And some of the times he uses the phrase, like as, which means it was so wild, I don't know how to put it in words, because unless you saw it, you don't know, but I can tell you, it was kind of like. And when you stop and think of some of the things that it describes, you know, when we talk about gold, we talk about the, the amount of carrots in the gold and how pure it is. And the Bible says that the streets of this city were paved with pure gold. No impurities. Nothing in there that was contaminated. Nothing in there that was wrong. It was pure. The same thing with the walls. The same thing with the gates. Pure pearl. One solid pure pearl. And it was there. It's talking about the grandeur. When, you know, when, when it talks about the size of that city, it begins and, and it tells us that that city is a certain height, a certain width, and a certain depth. And he says that it is 12 thousand furlongs. You know what that equates to in our terminology when we talk about a furlong? 12,000 furlongs equates to 1,500 
miles, not kilometers, miles. So a city 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles high. Now, some people in the Bible say, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Some places refers to it as a house. In my Father's house are many mansions. When we begin to look at that, you realize that that 1,500 miles, if you gave space in that city and said every floor in that city is a tenth of a mile high, just the floor, the room. You know, we go eight foot ceilings, 12 foot ceilings. A large theater, maybe higher. But if we went a, a tenth of a mile high for every floor, that would give you over 33 billion square miles of floor space. That's many times the total size of this planet Earth. So what I'm saying is the way the Bible gives us and the information, it lets us know the grandeur, the size, the magnificence of this thing that is almost entirely beyond compare. The Bible tells us the Queen of Sheba, when she visited Solomon, and the Bible says she went to see the temple, that her spirit left her, she fainted. And uh, when she came back, she was talking about the, the grandeur of seeing how that the, the servants of Israel, the servants of God, came in and out of the temple and worshipped. And she said, the half has not been told me. Friend, I'm telling you, when we look at all the description that we have received through revelation and through the, uh, through the word of God, the Bible, all that it has to tell us, the half cannot be fancy of what it's really going to be like when we get there. That new Jerusalem, that principle of its glory and the structure of it, the other thing is going to be its glory, its safety, and its pureness. Listen to what verse 22 through 27 says. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. There wasn't a need for light because the glory of God who dwelt there, it was his dwelling place. The glory of God illuminated everything. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. You talk about a beautiful place. And then he says, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light in it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut. Listen to this. Shall not be shut at all. By day, for there shall be no night therein. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. The ones that will be entering into that city and coming and going, their name is written in the Lamb's book of life. No one else will be going. And the thing it says is those gates are never going to be closed. Why? You think, why? Because of the safety, the glory, first of all, about it, the size of it, and God's glory being the light of the city. Then there's the safety aspect, the huge walls and the gates that are there. But the gates are never closed because they don't have to worry about an enemy. All enemies have already put, been put under his feet and made in subjection and there's nothing that is evil nothing of an abomination nothing that worketh evil or anything like that is going to enter that city 
so the gates stay open wide all the time. Then chapter 22, verse 1 through 5, talks about something else that's in that city. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, verse 1 of chapter 22, clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the streets of it and on either side of it of the river was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruit and yielded her fruit every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So he tells us that in that city, there's going to be a river a river of life. The Bible says that that river, Jesus spoke way about it way back in the Gospels when he talked about, he says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me. Out of his, and then he says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. If you have this water, you'll never thirst again, he says. Why? Because its source is not earthly, it's heavenly you can partake of the throne of God, all the grace that's there and the salvation that he has provided. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The Bible says, as a deer panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my heart after thee, O God. And our hearts cry out for the satisfaction of of thirst that can only come through the living waters of God. And there's a river of life that's flowing through that city. You see, the people of God are going to inhabit that city. God is going to be with them. There will be no more trials. All of our trials are going to give way to everything being made brand new. You talk about a beautiful city. Those who have tasted of the water of life freely are able to enter into it. The symbols of that city that we mentioned, that heavenly nature and God is there and the walls and the pureness of everything there. All of those things are there for us because he has prepared that place for his children to dwell in. There'll be no night. Nothing unclean will enter the city. You know, I was born and raised here in New Brunswick in the Miramichi area and uh, lived outside of town, out in the country. And for most of my life, we never locked a door. Matter of fact, most of the time, we left our keys in the car. And you didn't, really, you didn't have to lock your shed where your tools and things were because everybody was your neighbor and everything was fine. But I moved into town, and my wife, she refers to herself as a townie, and uh, she told me, Paul, you've got to learn to lock the car. And uh, I didn't really pay attention to her until one day, my next door neighbor, an elderly gentleman, him and his wife were sitting in their kitchen having a lunch. And uh, his, what, they had their inside door open, the screen door was in. And his wife looked at him and asked him, said, was someone coming up from the garage to pick up your car? Because he had talked about getting someone to take it into the garage to uh, get some work done on it. And he said no. And she said, well, someone just drove out of our driveway with our car. And someone in the middle of the day had come into their driveway, got in their car, started it, and took off with it. And it was recovered down in Moncton area. But that was my next-door neighbor, so I thought after that, oh, um, Maybe I better start locking the car door and make sure the keys aren't in the ignition. And when I went to bed at night, I locked the inside doors of that coming into the house. And my wife said, you may want to lock the outside door too because they could get into the breezeway and get things that are in the breezeway. So we had to start being conscious of the fact that there were those 
that would come in and take things that didn't belong to them. But you know what? You don't have to lock the doors in heaven. The gates are never going to be closed because there's not going to be thieves will never enter that city. Liars will never enter that city. Adulterers will never enter into that city. Sin will never enter into that city. What a beautiful and glorious place it is. And that when we look at that, uh, the river of life being there and all the things that are there for us, as I mentioned earlier, some may be symbolic, some may be literal. I prefer to take an aspect, a, a look at it, and say, I believe there's a combination of both. There's some things, I believe John couldn't quite get the words, and he just used some things to describe what he, he saw to try and relate the pureness, the richness, the grandeur of it, the beauty of it, all its aspects and the glory of God. When he talks about the glory of God and he talks about it sounding like many waters, the roar of the crowd that were worshiping God and, and all the elders in that, that that bow down and cast their crowns before the throne and worship the Lord, worship the Lamb and how it, it, it was like thunder and it was like water, many waters, like a great surging tide from the ocean beating against rocks. And he, he tried to expand our idea and our concept of how great heaven is going to be. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians, and I want to turn there real quick. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Second chapter and verse 13. The Bible says, which things also we speak, not in the words which men's wisdom teach us, but with the Holy Ghost, with the Holy Ghost teaching, compared spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for there are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They are spiritually discerned. God has given us a great revelation about heaven and all that's been prepared for us, but our understanding of that is only, go only going to be open if we are spiritual enough to be able to discern and understand the things that he is saying to us. The Queen of Sheba said, the half can't be told me. The Bible tells us that Paul tells us it has to be spiritually discerned. The natural man can't comprehend it. Paul, in another one of the epistles, he said, I has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men the things that he has prepared for them that love him. So our eyes haven't been able to take it in. Our ears, sometimes we, we talk about uh, a choir or something sounding like, like angels singing. Friend, we have no concept at all of what it will be like to hear heaven's choir. We have no idea what it will be like to hear the song of the redeemed sung by the host of heaven and the children of God when we gather on the other side. We have no idea what it is to, to understand or to see the glory that will be so great that we don't even, there's no need for a, a light or a sun or a candle or anything because his glory is going to fill the entire place. So we've got a place that is so magnificent. It's our home. It's blessed, the blessed home of the redeemed. Revelations, the 14th chapter. Here we go. Revelations, the 14th chapter, and verse 13 
says this. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead. Blessed, he said, are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. It's a blessed place of rest, the word of God teaches us. It teaches us that it is a, a place of reward for reaping. Jesus taught about that when you sow, you reap more than what is sown. There's a multiplication that takes place. Sometimes when we look at the things that we do here on earth for God and for the kingdom of God, we look sometimes and we say, well, I didn't do that much. I tried my best to do some things and I witnessed, I talked to some folks about the Lord, but friend, we have no idea how far that goes through eternity and the results of what can be done through what we did. I, uh, I thought of a, a, a lady that I, I met here back several years ago. When I was young, late teens and early 20s, uh, some of us from the church used to hold a street meeting uh, in down a little community where I was from. And uh, we'd set up some speakers and a microphone and folks would play some instruments and we'd sing and then one or two folks would maybe give a little testimony about how God had ch changed their lives and, and saved them and filled them with his spirit. And uh, a lot of folks would make fun some folks would be sitting close by in their cars and they'd rid the engines and squeal the tires and different things like that. And uh, wondered, you know, did we ever accomplish anything? We did it. We did it faithfully for the summer months, every week. And tw over 20 years later, I was at a church and I was speaking and at the end of the service, uh, a lady, I thought I recognized her, she came up to me and she introduced herself to me. And when she introduced herself, I said, oh, yes, I remember you. Uh, she had lived just down the hill. There was a steep hill where we used to hold the uh, street meeting, the top of the hill, but down at the bottom of the hill, her parents lived. And she said, you know, when you guys, remember when you folks used to have that street meeting? And I said, yes. She said, you may not have known it, but she said every night that you folks had that street meeting, my mom and I would go out and sit in the veranda and listen to everything you said. And she said, we never forgot it. And you know, throughout eternity, I didn't know that until she told me. The things that we do, the things that we share, the manner of life that we live, all of those things are seed being sown and we have no idea what the reward will be for that in eternity because you will always reap more than what you sow. The realm, there's a realm of righteousness in the New Jerusalem, in that place where we're going. The Bible, if you look at it, you realize that the Bible says there's a holy God that dwells there. Holy angels dwell there. And the people of God, the just, live there. The ones that have been redeemed. There'll be no prisons there. It's going to be a little bit uh, surprising to some folks. There's going to be a realm of responsibility. John says in Revelations 22, verse 3 through 5, listen again to what he said in some of the last verses that I read for you. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants, we are the servants of God, shall serve him. And they, referring to the servants, shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. And they, the servants, shall reign forever and ever. Jesus looked at his disciples one time when they came to him with a problem, and uh, he said, 
what, you, you mean you can't deal with this? Don't you realize that you are going to reign with me in the kingdom of God? You're going to rule over nations. You're going to be given responsibility. So it's going to be a place of responsibility. Gospel of Luke, the 19th chapter, and verse 16 through 19. Luke 19, 16 through 19. Let me read it for you. Then came the first, saying, Lord, they pound, uh, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well done, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in the very little, thou hast authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, there is thy pound, which I kept laid up in a, in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man, and thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up which I laid not down, and reaping what I did not sow. <coughs> Wherefore, then, give us not thy money unto the bank, that at the coming I might have required more my own with usury. And he said unto him that stood by, Take him from the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. And he said unto you, But I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even he that shall be taken away from him. So Jesus was teaching a parable, and he was teaching the fact of the, a multiplication. He said, there was another parable he used, I mentioned about the sower. He said, I'm giving you a talent. You take that, and you use it, and you multiply it. If you don't, he said, I could have gave it to someone, and they just gave me the interest. But you didn't even bother to do that. So there is a need. We look at it and we see there is going to be a responsibility. God requires us to be good stewards. There's also going to be reunion in heaven. This is what get a lot, gets a lot of folks excited. When we make it to heaven, we're going to see him face to face. The Bible talks about us sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're going to sit down with him. Matthew, the 8th chapter. There's, there's so many scriptures and things that we could have taken time with today, but time does not allow us to be able to do it all. And he said, I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. They'll be coming from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And we're going to come into the kingdom of God and we're going to sit down and fellowship with those that have gone before. The lastly, friends, I want to look today, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1. This is the scripture that I referred to just a, a few minutes ago. We have, the Bible talks about, a blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. 1 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 says, For the which cause I say also, uh, that uh, cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul, writing to Timothy, said, Timothy, I am persuaded, I'm convinced, I'm positive 
of the hope that I have. It's not just simply something that I think about or, or I think will happen, but it is something I am positive, I am sure of. My hope is anchored. It is steadfast. So there is the reliability of our hope. We have a hope, friend, beyond this life. We have a hope of another place. The Bible says, Abraham looked for a city that had foundation, whose builder and maker was God. And we look for a city coming down out of heaven, the new Jerusalem. Some call it heaven, songwriter said. I call it home. I mentioned last week about an old chorus that says, there's a beautiful home far over the sea. There's a beautiful home for you and for me. And this glittering tower, the sun will outshine. And that beautiful home someday will be mine. God bless you today. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you today for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your word and the promise that we have. We thank you for the hope that we have, Lord. Your word said that if we had hope in this life only, we would be of all men most miserable. <coughs> but we have a hope that goes beyond this life. We look for a city. We look for our, an eternity in the presence of God, experiencing your glory and seeing your face. And Lord, with all that it holds for us, we started on this journey and there's no desire to turn back. And Lord, I pray today for those that have heard the word of God, that have listened to this short Bible study. Lord, if they're feeling like, what's the sense of going on? If they're feeling discouraged, if they're feeling like, why? Why do I go through all the things that I go through? Why don't I just throw up my hands and quit? There is a reward at the end of this journey. There's joy in the journey, Lord, walking with you and knowing you and feeling your presence every day in our lives. But even greater than that is going to be the fact that there is for us at the end of the journey a crown of righteousness laid up for each one of us. And Lord, I pray that that one that's feeling discouraged would surrender to you today and allow your love to flow over them and take courage and hope in the knowledge of what you have prepared for them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends. Have a good week. Enjoy walking with God.